I remind people that uh, you know there, there actually is probably uh, less war and less violence uh, uh, around the world today uh, than there might have been 30, 40 years ago. Um, it doesn't make it any less painful, uh, but uh, but things can get better. We just have to be vigilant and we have to have strong partners. Some things a lot of people would argue with in that statement. A senior leader of this group has been sentenced to 20 years in a Mauritania prison for planning to attack Australia. In the last 24 hours, a drone strike has killed five suspected members of their bloody band in South Yemen. And more than a few experts are wondering out loud if al-Qaeda is on the decline. Perhaps, but they will never go quietly. And they may need to turn their attention to another group of butchers who would like nothing more than to be king of the murderous mountain. Our first guest is an internationally recognized expert on Islamism, a former lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy and author of A Battle for the Soul of Islam, an American Muslim Patriot's Fight to Save His Life. Welcome back, Dr. Zudi Jasser, also joined by former senior policy advisor for counterterrorism and intelligence to the chairman of the House Committee on Homeland Security, Joshua Katz. Gentlemen, I thank you both for joining me today. Thank, thank you. you. Judy, let me come to you first here, because there is that question right now. And I have in front of me even an article from the Huffington Post that asks the question, is al-Qaeda in decline? Seriously? Because there are people who would find that very difficult to believe. I can't tell you how Orwellian that statement is. I mean, al-Qaeda actually on the rise. ISIS may be on the decline, uh, uh, but the bottom line is, is radical Islam and its permutations that include Jabhat al-Nusra, Khorasan, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, Jamaat Islamiyah, every permutation are all manifestations of the same disease. And that disease is the spread of radical Islam that has filled a vacuum that arose from the opportunities, really, of the Arab awakening that now, because we've not been involved, because we've not had a strategy, have allowed the most evil in the world, including Iran, the Wahhabis of Saudi Arabia, the Qataris, uh, Russia, and others, to fuel radicalization and movements that are really against us and you're seeing a, a open season a pandemic against christians a exodus of christians from the middle east a open season in syria against sunnis who are against the regime i mean everywhere you look there's more death and destruction from radical islam than we've ever seen before joshua when we take this all into account then a report that came out just yesterday from one of the overseas middle eastern press associations which uh, associations rather which says isis and taliban announcing jihad against each other well I, I guess people would like to see that you would like to believe that maybe they'll cancel each other out and kill each other but is that really a possibility it's not a possibility they're not going to cancel each other out there's always infighting here uh, this is a problem. The problem with radical uh, Islamic groups is, yes, at times they, they fight against each other. Other times they work uh, with each other. They're very opportunistic. So they're going to do whatever it takes uh, in order to achieve their own individual goals. Uh, but it's, it's important here to note, Ed, that my sources in Afghanistan and Pakistan for at least the last seven months have been tracking ISIS movements within those countries and our, uh, and their actions in there uh, in Afghanistan, uh, attacking the Taliban, uh, recruiting Taliban members under the, uh, the penalty of death. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an ongoing feud. Uh, this is an ongoing feud for, uh, for power and for land. Doctor, let me bring it down then to, to what some people want to talk about, and that is the fact that maybe, just maybe, we could have these two groups on the run. Somehow, some way, there are people believing that we actually can do it and we actually still have the ability to do it quickly. We're kidding ourselves, aren't we? We really are, and, and it's a continued whack-a-mole program, not only domestically but globally. And, you know, you may get one group on the run, but as we see in Yemen and we've seen in Iraq, uh, al-Qaeda rises because, uh, for example, in Yemen, the old uh, supporters in the military of Saleh who now have uh, become the enemies of King uh, Hadi, uh, are, are supporting al-Qaeda and helping them. In Iraq, similarly, the old uh, Ba'athist uh, generals have sort of stood back as ISIS went through because they want to see the Shiites defeated. So because there's no adult supervision in the Middle East, you have this, this Game of Thrones from above, and you have these radical groups that are sort of co-opting. You know, to say that one group is on the run is sort of like saying Ebola virus is gone because we treated that one in Dallas when in fact you're not treating the source 
and the ideological manifestation that's going to be around for generations. All right, when we talk about being ahead for generations here and being ahead of us, let me then ask you both with regard to what we just heard the president say, and he said this in an interview within the last 24 hours, that he believes that the world is less violent today than it was 40 years ago. I guess we're talking about late Cold War, but we're still talking about 1975. Dr. Jasser, what do you think? Are we more peaceful now? Or, or once again, is this president just trying to just trying to gloss over some really bad news for the world. Again, the narrative that President Obama and his entire operation uses is that we're fighting violent extremism. That is a symptom. So the symptom may up and go up and down and tick up or tick down. Literally up, so I don't know what parameter he's using if you look at most terrorist statistics of 2014. But set that aside. Violence is a so he's wrong then in many ways, I guess is what you would say, Dr. Jasser. But to you, Joshua, then, do you think he's wrong? I mean, to come out and say that we are, we are less violent now than 40 years ago? It just sounds so simplistic. It, it, it is, Ed. And if you listen, actually, to the word choice of the president, he used the word probably. Uh, there is no <laughs> probably about it here. Uh, that That's political speak for I can really say anything that I want and kind of get away with it. It's political uh, speak for a snow job. Absolutely. There, we are not safer. The world is not safer. There's no decrease. You know, we're not, there's not a decrease in violence here. Uh, the world is more chaotic, in part because of our lack of leadership around the globe, uh, the lack of guidance, and uh, as the doctor pointed out, the lack of adult supervision, which has really been our position. And by taking us out of that role, we've really created. All this chaos that's just going on, not only in the Middle East, uh, but around the world. i got uh, a little less than two minutes left. I have to ask you both this very quickly. This has come up in a lot of conversations that we have had around the office. When it comes down to homeland terrorism, the terror that comes here, people that live in this country, this is going to sound, again, really simplistic, but we had somebody ask the question, Joshua, to you first, why don't we just give them, if we find out that they're here plotting against America, give them a plane ticket, send them overseas, and basically cancel their citizenship. You can't get back into America, period, end of story. How's that sound for just at least a way to start? Or again, are we just kind of playing a simple game here? No, and this is really complicated. And I think, unfortunately, it's really complicated because there's a lot we don't know. It's not the people that we've identified already. It's the people we haven't. But the ones uh, we have identified, the ones we have identified, kick them out, cancel their citizenship, give them a plane, say, you want to go play terrorist? Go. Well, they're still going to uh, pose a threat to U.S. interests. So I think that we need to uh, uh, send them through the the uh, judiciary system here. We need to uh, go back to even executions. If they are traitors well, to their nation, let's call them what they wait are. Wait a minute, you're talking traitors. about actually taking people that we find here and executing them? We're at war, Ed. Okay. Why? I, I know it's not politically palatable. That's not politically correct. You know there's people going to question that right away. Dr. Jasser, i got about 30 seconds left. Your take on this. Well, remember, Imam Awlaki was allowed to go to Yemen, and we ended up having to drone him because he was radicalizing. al Shabab had the Americani, who was an American uh, um, uh, emigrant, who ended up becoming a huge radicalizer. So these problems don't go away, and they become targets on the battlefield. We have to have a strategy to look at what is driving Islamo-patriotism for these people to drive into serving the Islamic State and how to drive American patriotism within Muslim society communities here in America. Gentlemen, what we have just proven here is that nothing is a simple answer. Everything takes an awful lot of time and an awful lot of years. Dr. Zudi Jasser and Joshua Katz, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. We'll do it again soon. Thank you, Ed. All right, take care. We're heading for the arena with some common sense about American desire for electric cars, drones, and what's happening in Baltimore next.